very nice to see you again. Um, I just realized that uh, indeed it has been my third time for Amsterdam PHP. Uh, so uh, back in when I first started, I did a talk on Twig a uh, long time ago. You were there. <laughs> right. And um, I think it was a very boring uh, talk, uh, like looking back at it, because I was trying to cover all of it, and I wanted to, uh, to tell, tell you all like, how wonderful this, this technology is. Um, nowadays, I'm doing more of a like, more of high-level talk, so it's more about uh, design uh, principles uh, and basically ideas to, to get you started um, uh, on your own projects. Because like, even if you don't want to use Twig, uh, yeah, you, sh you should get something from that. Um, and it should be the same for, uh, for today's talk. Uh, because, yeah, this is about services, about uh, designing for autonomy. Um, I'm, I'm saying services because, uh, like, like my book's uh, title is Microservices for Everyone. Uh, it's a bit of a hyped word, and I, I know that many will feel that, like, oh, no, please don't uh, shut up about microservices. Like, uh, I don't want to hear about uh, any of that. Uh, but um, there are some interesting ideas that you can take from, from this whole area of expertise, and I'm sure it will make your projects uh, better. So uh, I don't know if you recognize the thing on the left. Uh, that will be uh, the monolith application where uh, everything is going on and uh, like every part is uh, grabbing anything it needs from any other part of this, this application. Um, and the box also contains the big database, of course. Uh, so you can, you can get anything from that if you like. So then, oh, there's, there's not so, so, much bright, uh, so many bright colors over there. Uh, but the idea was that this is a, a nice depiction of a service architecture where you have multiple services working together to, to do the same thing basically as, as the monolith uh, was trying to do. Um, so the colors try to uh, get to you the message that this is the more uh, approved way of, uh, of working. Like uh, this is the, the nicer, the more good looking way. Uh, if you've heard about these microservices and, and their architectural uh, principles, you may feel like, hmm, yeah, could, couldn't we do something like that in our uh, company, in our uh, current project? Uh, maybe we just uh, split some of the services, or maybe for our next project we, we start creating maybe uh, tens or hundreds of, of these services from the start. Um, this is actually from uh, the ThoughtWorks um, uh, tech radar, where a couple of years ago uh, th this term came up, uh, microservice envy. We all like microservices, but we feel that this is not, not going to work for our projects. Um, and they, uh, they say something like, oh, you can just start out with maybe two or three of these services and see what it brings you. Uh, um, also discover what are the, um, the technical difficulties, what are the, the cultural difficulties. And I think that these, some of these books uh, are related to this topic as well, because you, you will need more expertise on the level of uh, uh, infrastructure. Um, the thing is, uh, I had this microservice envy as well, uh, and there was no opportunity to uh, apply any of it to uh, any real-life projects, <laughs> except maybe for listening in on some of my colleagues' uh, projects. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I started to look for ways to sort of satisfy uh, this envy, sort of get rid of it. Um, and that was writing a book about it. So uh, I started out and uh, tried to find out anything about this topic, uh, learn as much as I can about it, um, dis distill some of the ideas and write a book, um, basically for, for any kind of developer, but uh, as it might be interesting for you to know, uh, there are lots of PHP related examples, uh, which is also a bit of a controversial thing because many PHP projects aren't very suitable for a microservice architecture. Uh, but well, this is sort of the hypothesis. Like, you could do something like that um, with PHP as well. Um, and there are some, some interesting technical examples uh, in this book. So if you're interested uh, and don't win the prize for tonight, then uh, yeah, just go to LeanPub and uh, get a copy. There is also a print uh, version. So enough about uh, like the book and the commercial stuff. Uh, let's go into the, the theory. Uh, what are the concepts uh, at hand here? I think um, a microserv microservice architecture is a very interesting thing uh, because of a several, uh, several of these reasons. Um, it will help you define uh, team responsibilities in a much more clear way. Uh, you can separate out different areas of expertise within your company and uh, put teams on these different areas and let them work on some code for these areas. Um, then it will help you um, add new people to the team because you can sort of uh, dedicate a team to a, to a particular set of uh, services. 
So that's an interesting option for a microservice architecture. Um, then it, it should and can and could, or maybe, well, never will help you uh, prevent the big ball of mud. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a difficult thing. Uh, if, you, if you know the principles and apply them always, you can get rid of this, this, this big ball of mud, this monolith monolithic architecture. Uh, but there is always the danger of ending up with a uh, distributed monolith. That's, that's, that's the danger. Uh, so, but you have to know what you're doing, right? And that's, the, that's why I'm doing these kinds of uh, talks and book writing. Uh, it will also help you scale horizontally. Um, in terms of server uh, architecture, you can just, instead of uh, increasing memory size and disk size, etc., um, you can look for multiple servers and uh, let them work next to each other. So that can be interesting if you have that kind of uh, problem, of course. So that's good to keep in mind. Um, the big problem is uh, design. And so you can just uh, start with all the technology. You can use uh, Docker or Docker uh, as a start. But um, then it's all, it's all about the code, right? Uh, you have to think about uh, how to set it up, how to set up these services, how to make them work together in such a way that you don't, you don't end up with all of this, this connectedness. Uh, you want to design for autonomy and make sure that when one service is down, not all the other services are crashing as well. Uh, because that's what, what's still happening if you don't uh, think about this uh, too much. And if you think about it, uh, if you want to have this big application, you want to split it into services, um, it will never be possible to have these services run really in a standalone way. There is always some cooperation, uh, because otherwise like, these services will run on their own and they will, will not be useful to you in any way. So they have to work together uh, and provide you with well, whatever is needed to fulfill your, uh, your needs. In one sense, uh, one service may need another service uh, to do something for it. So service A will send a command to service B, like say, do this, do that, uh, do something for me. Uh, and that's a dependency. But yeah, you will find this in any kind of service uh, architecture. There is some cooperation. You need to send something to some other service. So, but this is a dependency that is problematic. Uh, because if B is down and not listening to you, uh, then well, what, what can you do as if you're, if you're A, right? Uh, the same goes for uh, queries. It's, it's, it's the other part. It's always command, query. Uh, if A wants to know something about B uh, and it waits for some results uh, getting back for the query, uh, it's really dependent on B and it's not very autonomous. It, it needs to wait for B uh, to answer, so that's a big problem. Uh, it needs B to be uh, live. Uh, and, well, uh, deployed correctly, so there, there cannot be any bugs going on, uh, no server issues, no connectivity issues. Uh, so that, that, that is a big dependency. And if you look at um, uh, most real-life systems that use multiple services behind the first, uh, maybe, gateway, uh, this is what's happening. Uh, the user uh, does something with uh, your application, and this triggers a whole uh, chain of, of requests, basically, uh, going from service to service to service. Uh, and every request takes some time, whether it be a command or a query, it, it will take some time to, uh, to fulfill this request. Um, and this quickly adds up. And then at some point there will maybe a service that takes a really long time. It may talk to some other server that's on the other end of the world or is just uh, badly designed. Um, and maybe at some point even something breaks uh, along the way. Uh, and then like the answer that the user is waiting for, uh, it, they will never get it because, well, uh, there is something missing in this chain. <coughs> so, yeah, something goes wrong and the whole system uh, collapses and there's, there's no use for it anymore. There's one thing you can do uh, that's basically to cut this chain. Uh, you say whenever the user comes and says, oh, I want you to do this, uh, the system just gives some generic response. It basically accepts the message saying, yeah, okay, uh, I accept your command. I'm, I'm going to do this. Uh, but not right away, and you definitely should not wait for it. Uh, so I will get back to you when I'm done. Um, that's, that's maybe a pretty viable solution in many cases. Many more cases than you might think of, basically. So it's always good to think of this as a, as a possible solution instead of um, accepting your product owner's word for it that this has to be done immediately uh, and the customer has to wait for it uh, and wants to know that it's, it's done, right? There is there's many more room for this kind of uh, options. Um, but you still have this issue where uh, even if you, if you cut between the user and, and, and the, the underlying services, um, there are still commands sending commands to other services, uh, trying to make other services do stuff. 
Um, and this means that still, if, if, if any of this is not available, or not running, or buggy, or anything, uh, it's going to be a big problem for uh, your system as a whole. And that's where you need to think of a different way of designing your services. Uh, you need to get rid of these arrows pointing from service to service. Um, and if you know about uh, events in, in code, like if you, if you use a framework with an event dispatcher, you already have some experience with uh, changing the direction of these arrows, basically. Instead of saying to some other thing, do this, you can emit an event and let the other thing respond to that event. That's basically the same solution that we're looking for at the, at the service level. Um, and this is called sort of a reactive uh, way of, of design. Um, it's not, I don't know really if it's always opposed to imperative, but it feels like the same uh, like distinction, where uh, if you look at code, it can be very imperative. It, it can be like, do this, do that, uh, then do this, uh, and also fetch this and, and this. Um, and now with reactive programming, you're, you're changing uh, your style. Uh, and I'm, I'm making a little bit of a mistake here because reactive programming is a different style of programming. This is more reactive system design. So there's a bit of a distinction there. So if you're Googling for that, uh, be aware of that. Um, we are basically changing from uh, just a linear way of thinking. Uh, first we do this, then we do that, um, and then we do something else, to uh, basically we still start with do something, but then uh, when this has happened, uh, do that. And this is sort of a, a correlation where you uh, simply respond to a certain thing that has happened. And then when that has happened, uh, do something else. And so even if there is, there is time between these things, um, it, it will still happen. It, we will just wait for, for the event to happen and we will respond to that. At the level of services, this is very interesting because um, if you do it in the imperative way where a service talks to another service saying, do this, do that, uh, it's about this service on the left knowing what to do and when to do it uh, the service on the right knowing how to do this exact work. Like it, it has all the implementation details. If you change to a more of a reactive style, then uh, there is uh, one service that simply emits an event. Uh, not saying that, it, that the other service oops, has to do something. Okay, well, <laughs> it's still good. <laughs> like the service on the left is not saying to the service on the right, you have to do something. It's just saying, I did something or something has happened. And the other service is going to send a command to itself based on that event because it knows what should happen uh, when, well, after the event, and it also knows how it should happen. So this basically uh, combines all of this knowledge uh, in one place, and that's very good for your uh, system's design. Still, at some point, uh, something may go wrong. Like the event may be dispatched uh, or emitted or whatever, uh, and the other service is not uh, responding, or is, it, is not, uh, or maybe responding in the wrong way, or there is some bug going on, or uh, a failed database migration, something like that. So you as a user don't know what's going on, um, and as a system maintainer, you, you don't either. Uh, you, you don't know if that service is up and running. Maybe you have monitoring, but still something may be wrong about it uh, that you don't notice. Uh, so there, there is still some need for more insight into the whole process that's going on when the user clicks something uh, and whatever is happening uh, in the background. And there is a very nice uh, technical solution for it. It's called uh, Process Managers. And, um, well, let me just show you an image of what a Process Manager is supposed to do, so, sort of. Um, it's going to listen to these events within the system, um, and it's going to uh, create new commands, new events, uh, inside of itself. So it's basically a different service that's also in the, the system of these services. Um, but instead of just assuming that someone will listen and someone will respond, uh, it will also keep track of the current state of a process. Um, so it will not make any assumptions, it will just keep track of where are we now in this process. Uh, and like, if you monitor this state, if you, if you keep track of it, if you look at it, what's going on, maybe users are uh, stuck at some point in the process, um, maybe there is something going on there. Maybe it's a user issue, maybe it's a system issue, uh, but this is at least one way of keeping track of what's going on uh, overall in these business processes. Um, so that's a nice, uh, nice uh, way of looking at uh, the processes within such a system and to keep track of it. Um, if you want to do some uh, really inception-like stuff here, you could make this state tracker uh, event sourced, um, uh, just in case you're, you're uh, aware of event sourcing. 
um, because then you can even keep track of all of the states that have been happening previously uh, in these process, uh, processes. So it might be an interesting, uh, uh, well, it might give you some interesting insights into how users are going through your system, doing stuff there. Um, <clears throat> this is an example of uh, uh, the state tracker that was inside of the process manager. Um, just an example from, uh, from a famous book, The CQRS Journey. Uh, it's, um, it's a Microsoft book uh, co-written with Greg Young, so it should be good. Uh, and it is good, but well, maybe a little bit outdated. Uh, but it has a very nice example, including code and everything, about um, uh, these services communicating with each other. Uh, they do use event sourcing and CQRS, but um, uh, this is a nice example of, of what's going on. Like the user uh, wants to order tickets for a conference, uh, so they, they place an order. And then uh, it uses the, the reservation pattern to first make a reservation for the seat, then let the customer make their payment. And when the payment is as finished between like 0 and 15 minutes or something, um, they will uh, uh, really accept the order and, and make the reservation uh, final. Because yeah, at some point, if may maybe payment doesn't work out well or uh, something else goes wrong, you have to free up these seats, right? So that's where uh, order expired, um, finishes the process, and the seats will be um, uh, well given back to the system. Uh, but this is just an interesting way of looking at, the, at, at a, a whole process. Instead of uh, doing all kinds of if checks and, and doing stuff like in an imperative way, we respond to certain things happening in the system, and we are, in a, um, uh, we are much better able to deal with uh, different situations, that, that things that may go wrong, uh, or things that we just didn't uh, think of yet. <coughs> now the question is where do these events come from? Well, they come from the services themselves where the things are happening. So whenever a service makes a state change, there's always an event being emitted uh, to anyone who's interested in listening, uh, basically. So you get these uh, nice uh, shining services where uh, lots of stuff are uh, going out and uh, other services can uh, listen in on that. These events will be very useful later on if we are tackling the other half of the problem. Uh, just summarizing now, uh, we saw that sending commands to other services is a dependency issue where uh, it makes services less independent. Uh, so if, if you want services to be autonomous, you cannot just uh, send commands to them uh, because they have to be there, they have to be listening, they have to be uh, responsive. Um, so we need to do something else. We need to tell the user, we accept your command. Yes, we are going to do this. It's sort of a promise, but you can always get back to that, of course. Um, and then you process the first step and emit an event about it. You, you produce an event, you re register it somehow, and anyone else, any other service is able to uh, respond to this event and take on to the next step, uh, do whatever they think is necessary. Um, and maybe two or three services are listening to the same event. That's, that's perfectly fine. Um, and of course, these services are going to do something that also triggers uh, more events to be generated. So that's a very interesting um, solution in itself. And then if you want still to have some insight into what's going on uh, uh, in the entire system, if you want to keep track of a process that, that is being completed, like uh, a sales process where you want uh, uh, people to order something and also to deliver it, yeah, then uh, you can do this with uh, process management keep in track of current state, um, and make the process manager make the decision about what has to happen next, like sending the commands or sending uh, more events. Okay, this more or less uh, would be able to tackle your, your command dependency uh, issue. But then there's the query issue. Uh, it's related, but it's a different story. It's, it's basically two branches. I think it's very interesting that commands and queries um, uh, you, will, you will find the same distinction at, at the code level where there's command query separation, uh, command query responsibility segregation, and then command queries at service uh, level. And they are all the same thing. Because like, if you look at the code for commands sending to uh, s other services, you will find a command method eventually that does the work and makes the change. Um, so it's just good to keep in mind that we are really talking about the same thing. And in a sense, we could have something like functions or methods become services themselves. OK? <laughs> but that's going very far. Um, OK, so now about the, que the queries, right? 
uh, a service A calls query uh, calls service B to um, to send a query to it to to get something some information from the other service, and it will get a result back. Right? This is a very familiar thing. You call a method, you get something back. It's a query method. You get a return value. Very useful. Uh, but there is another issue, of course, where uh, if you do this between services, um, and that's also the, the warning that people gave you about uh, microservices. Like if if you want your microservices to be uh, REST APIs coupled to each other, it's very dangerous. Uh, yeah, something is is uh, is out, is broken. Uh, everything will be broken. So very big issue there. Um, so we basically don't want uh, to send queries to other services, or not always. Like you, you can do this sometimes uh, if nobody is watching or nobody is waiting for you. Um, but if, if if there is a user there uh, and you want some certainty about this going to work, uh, yeah, you have to uh, not send a query. Uh, but yeah, how do you not send a query and still get the same uh, answer, right? You want to know what's going on in service B. So this is a, a bit of a paradoxical thing. Um, we have to think about what is uh, what is a, a query, what is a what is a result for a query, a response, um, and that's basically uh, information about the state of something. So if if I ask B uh, a question, I want an answer, and B can only answer because it is owner of its own state. Uh, so it it will give us an answer based on its own state. Hmm. Okay. So a query answers us uh, the question about what is the current state of something. But what if we want to already know the current state of something that's over there, right? Then we need to think about what current state is. What is the state of a thing? Um, basically, how did it end up like this? Uh, and that is more of the deep uh, thoughts about, uh, that's also behind event sourcing as well. Um, the current state of things is, is a result of all of the events that have happened before this moment, right? Um, Look at this example, where if we uh, uh, try to keep track of, of stock, of things that we have in stock, uh, we start with nothing, we purchase 10 things, and then we sell four things, so we ha end up with six things. That's basically a very like, real life situation. Um, um, yeah, if you have 20 employers and uh, fire 20, then you end up with zero, something like that. Um, that's, that's a big issue. Uh, you, you, you can know the answer if you know everything that has happened before this uh, moment, right? And that's, the, that's the, the, the exact answer that we are looking for in, uh, in our situation as well. So in order not to send the query to service B, we already need to be able to look into what has happened to B before this time, right? And we can keep track of that if A somehow gives us insight into this, this process. Um, so A collects or keeps track of all of its events that have happened inside of it, um, maybe in some sort of a <coughs> centralized way, there something like a queue where we can listen in on these events. And B, instead of asking questions to A, will just keep track of all of the events uh, from B and build up its own representation of B's internal state. OK. <laughs> I'm going to pause for a few seconds. <laughs> Is this clear? <laughs> OK. Uh, because this is a, a very maybe profound thing about if, if, if you don't uh, want to ask for an answer uh, or ask a question to get an answer, make sure you already have the answer. And that is possible by just listening in on whatever is happening outside of you. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in an answer, uh, make sure every information that is already there, uh, that, that you can get access to that before uh, you have to ask for it. Um, and in a sense, this is, this is the same thing as um, uh, event sourcing and CQRS. It's a combination of these, these two ideas where uh, like this, is, this is sort of the, uh, what's going on with CQRS. Uh, a command comes in, we want to do something, we want to change something. Uh, a handler uh, processes this change request. An aggregate gets modified. Um, it will be persisted by a repository. Then it dispatches domain events. Uh, subscribers or projectors to subscribe to these events and they update anything that are that is relevant uh, for, in relation to this event so there will be view models changed for that uh, search engines updated business reports uh, generated predictions made um, it's very interesting very useful um, and this this is really the way that you can create your service architecture if you have these events you can have services listening on the events and do very useful things for you 
uh, without even changing the source services, right? You can just add them and add new uh, functionality to this uh, system. So that's a pretty cool thing. You don't have to use event sourcing. That's just something to, to be clear about uh, in all of your services. Uh, it's just a matter of like at least create events and uh, uh, make sure that someone is, is listening to them, right? Uh, or is able to listen to them. Um, because this is, this is the way it happens with, with event sourcing. Uh, but you might just as well uh, use a regular ORM, uh, just an entity, store it, uh, but still generate events based on the changes that are happening. Maybe not domain events, maybe just system-wide events or something. Like I don't know how to call those events, but just events. Uh, and I suggest you store these events, uh, not just emit them or send them to a queue, because there will be a time when you want to replay these events. Uh, for example, if you want to add a service to your existing system, uh, and this service will be interested in all of the old events as well, or maybe some of the old events. So this new service should be able to look back at whatever has happened before and bring itself uh, well, up to speed with what has been going on in the system. Um, yeah, and that's why uh, it might be a good idea to, to, to um, look for a technical solution that uh, includes uh, queuing, uh, consuming, publishing messages, but also persisting these messages for a longer time. Uh, maybe you've heard of Kafka, uh, which I've also tried for the book. I have no production experience with this thing at all, but there is some interesting uh, aspect about it in the sense that it does this, this thing exactly. It, it helps you uh, consume messages that are added to a queue um, or some channel, I don't know what the exact name is. Uh, stream, what? topic, yeah, topic. Um, but then you can also go back to any point in time within that topic uh, and, and get the older events. Uh, so this is basically all of the ingredients you would need for this kind of setup. Then um, we have basically solved the second issue where uh, um, a service is no longer dependent in terms of uh, like really having to be online because you want to send a command to it. Um, now you can also uh, uh, take, take down a service uh, or make a mistake in a service um, and not cause system-wide trouble because uh, services don't need to answer their queries anymore. They just publish events and the other services can listen to these events and build up their own state. Um, so the services don't have to ask anything anymore. Uh, they can all know everything beforehand. Um, <laughs> in real life, this will not be viable, I think. So there will be some sort of a way in between where uh, some services uh, are very well designed, very stable, so they can just accept commands and queries. Uh, and some are less reliable, so you, you, you um, rely on this kind of a mechanism. Although there are people uh, and some good reports about that as well uh, who do it completely in this way. So there's, there's nothing immediate, nothing uh, um, uh, um, imperative about anything. It's all reactive. OK. Yeah, many options. Um, also, it's, it's just good to say that I'm just giving you ideas. Uh, so maybe um, uh, even if you don't think about your system having multiple services, as soon as your system or application is talking to something outside of its own boundaries, then you could already think about some of the ways to make um, uh, this application uh, less dependent on, on uh, availability outside. I still remember my first um, issue with that when um, I created a website where um, we had to add a Twitter, something like a box with the latest tweets about a certain hashtag. Um, and I just made a direct call to twitter.com. And of course, uh, <laughs> at some point, this website was down because Twitter was down. And um, yeah, it's in these kinds of situ situations where you're much better off, like instead of querying directly, make sure you query yourself and, and make sure you listen in on uh, this thing outside of you uh, in a separate process, so you don't have to worry about this um, this issue. So basically, I think you can make uh, make this system uh, vis without making all of these services connected to each other. And if someone tells you that um, uh, we shouldn't consider a service architecture, uh, whether that be uh, the traditional SOA stuff or uh, microservices, um, yeah, because you can do this right uh, with, with these very simple, basically, no, maybe not simple, but very uh, clean ideas about how to do this. Um, yeah, you, you can make something like this where, they, where, where all the services are really shining and uh, some, some services may just go on holiday if, if they like 
uh, and and not and the whole system won't fall apart, right? So that's a, would be a good idea. Um, I think I was well <laughs> well within the, within the given time limit. <laughs> Uh, so we have some time for uh, questions, if you like. Uh, uh, thank you at least for uh, listening, and uh, I hope this is useful for you in some way. Um, uh, and if so, please let me know. That would be great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. There is a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it would be interesting still to, to do some other monitoring about versioning, for example, like w which versions are uh, in use still. Uh, of course, the, the best answer to this is always to never do something that is breaking. Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 always be <laughs> really be careful about uh, about making those changes. <laughs> but but here's the thing. Um, uh, your system, and uh, like if you're if you're going to maintain multiple services, you have to to have a system in place that also uh, supports like m basically multiple updates for every day. You know, uh, something like continuous delivery also from from this this stuff over here. Um, uh, you have to set this up, and then um, in practice there won't be so much old stuff uh, going on. So you you will always be be innovating, always be changing. Uh, but it's something to be aware of. Like. Uh, of course, uh, developers, us developers, we, we will make these kinds of um, mistakes <laughs> at some point. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, if you have like a lot of services, how do you manage complexity? Because, for example, if you have a five man team uh, hmm. handling like multiple projects a year, and hmm. for example, uh, you have uh, a web shop that's handling uh, 10,000. Here's the thing where my experience is, like, I have no idea. <laughs> I just read books about it. Um, but there is one great book about it, uh, Production Ready Microservices, uh, by Suzanne Fowler. Maybe you know her, um, this book and author. Uh, she's quite famous because of her Uber stuff uh, going on. Um, Uber stuff. <laughs> Really ugly Uber stuff. Um, yeah, but this book is uh, uh, like it's not about Uber. Um, <laughs> it's just uh, some great experience material about uh, how to deal with uh, a, a, a quite a big team, uh, how to keep track of everything uh, they have. It's it's maybe even bureaucratic. You could say that uh, because you need a lot more stuff uh, uh, to be written down and to agree to be agreed upon. More like standards uh, for the whole team. You cannot just go ahead because that is that is the misconception about microservices. It's like, oh, we can now try this new technology or make this service in this language. That's a very bad idea for for the whole team or the whole company, of course. Uh, so you can do innovation. You can try new things uh, in a more safe and easy way with a service architecture. But um, yeah, you still have this problem of standardization. Yeah. So when does this what you talked about today? Hmm. What's what's the perfect company to apply this upon? Hmm. I don't know. Any company? <laughs> Your company? Can I just try and tackle that question? Yeah. So the further than the previous question. The first thing is, is that well, that's something that you know because the overhead that you have in running fifty different microservices is you know keeping them all up and you know, so you really have to have a good DevOps uh, infrastructure, monitoring, all of that around so you know the problem where it is and how to solve. So it's not by small teams that most process. I would not do this if you have a little tiny team. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, make sure you have at least some infra dedicated people, and that all mm -hmm. the developers are doing that. Well. That already helps keeping things up in the air. Mm -hmm. And to deal with you know things being spread out, the thing is microservices. I'm pretty sure Matthias already said this in, the, in other talks. Is they tend to reflect a bounded context, right? Mm -hmm. So usually when you have to make a change, if that change has to go across all your microservices, 
your architecture is not really good, right? Ideally, is you're dealing with one thing at a time, right? But you know, getting from I have an idea to do microservices and I have the right microservices, that road is trial and error, right? If you have a stable product that's you know selling for ten years and you have to go back to it, then hopefully it's stable enough that you yeah. have achieved that level of of quality. But I need to add a thing. There's a change here, followed by a change there, but not like a uh, where does this talk to right? The boundaries should be clear. But again, uh, for sure. Practice and uh, theory are yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Well, I, I have seen several companies where it would be great uh, to do it, uh, but the whole company has to support it as well. And like you said, uh, DevOps, uh, it's a cultural thing. So if you have developers that, that don't care and don't want to know anything about uh, deploying their, their things, uh, which, is, which is the mindset of, of DevOps, you, you, you want to um, build something and know how to run it, right? That's, that's the basic uh, premise. So then that will be a bit of an issue. Um, also, it may feel like, oh, the team is running away with this new new stuff, and uh, that's not good for business. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, everybody has to be um, well, on, on the same page about it. Because it's also, mm. I really want to de deploy mm. stuff, mm -hmm. but I don't want to deploy the stuff like 10 times. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, having 10 servers up and running. Yeah. So but I want to keep it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. If, if you can uh, come up with some improvements for that, uh, within your company, uh, it will almost always be like appreciated if it's possible within, well, many of these ugly concerns or constraints that may be there. Uh, yeah. I, it's, it's, a, it's a really difficult thing to, um, to accomplish. That's why I mentioned already that um, I hope this is, this is not a, a commercial for microservices, but more uh, of um, an encouragement to, uh, as soon as you th think of like dependencies um, from service to service, like, they should be up and running, uh, the, the connectivity issues, none of those. Uh, you know, when, when these concerns come into play, you should consider uh, uh, designing for autonomy and making sure that, that no, nothing breaks if something else breaks. Uh, just make sure you keep running and well, <laughs> all the rest can can break and fail and burn and. <laughs> yeah. Time for one more question. Yep. Okay. Yep. I'm having a question uh, because you're saying that uh, you are talking about querying, and uh, querying can be uh, divided in two types of queries, I think, hmm. because you can query a single model, you can single, yeah, well, some set. Also. Okay, yeah. And the uh, field wing of the models will be mm. uh, yeah, very dynamic and will almost be unable to cache it unless you're caching it at the moment the request takes place and mm -hmm. it needs to be invalidated, so just wild card and validate it again. Mm -hmm. um, so when you are uh, sending a query, uh, you want the system to already have the data available, which is completely doable in my mind. If it yeah. but Models. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, those models, of course, but that's another topic. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just, but uh, if, if you're uh, querying multiple models with, yeah, there's mm -hmm. a number of uh, filters, mm -hmm. I'm wondering how it's going to be there already. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I think you will be depending on a solar service or, or right. a database. Right, yeah. Um, and like in the most extreme situation, uh, you could even say that um, uh, several services would be allowed to reach into the same database. Uh, that's um, that's one of the, 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 I think people have, have caught up on this idea that uh, each microservice should have its own database, uh, or each service should have its own database. That's not a requirement at all. Uh, so if you, if you will be faster just getting the data, uh, and if there's no danger in, in uh, violating uh, uh, domain invariance, where um, uh, both services try to change the, sa the same thing, mm -hmm. basically treating the database in a read-only way, then that can be perfectly fine. Yeah, uh, so uh, to, to deal with this kind of situation. Yeah. As a backend for these kinds of services. Yeah. Copy yeah. Data. In general, copying data is is much more of a viable solution than many people will will think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's it's not it's no longer the single source of truth. It will just be copying, make it available wherever. Um, and update when needed. Just one other question. Mm -hmm. Just one other question. <laughs> okay. Is it uh, the, the 
Yeah, well, I mentioned Kafka, which is uh, so I mentioned Kafka, which is a sort of a, a more advanced solution. Also, uh, yeah, yeah, you can do it with RabbitMQ, but there always has to be a way to um, uh, not just uh, uh, publish and consume messages, but also uh, reconsume them or republish them. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. So that's technology. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>